Thank you for tuning in to Dream City Omaha Online. We hope you like this message and that it has an impact on your life. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more. All right, are you ready for the word? Sweet. I've got about 25 minutes. Um, we'll probably take a little bit longer than that. If you know me, if you're new to Dream City, uh, just go ahead and put your seatbelt on because we're probably going to fly through this uh, a little bit quickly. We've had a lot going on today, praying for the kids. I love praying for the kids. Next week is baby dedications. We're going to pray for more kids. It's going to be awesome. Um, but, but this week in our Bible reading plan, like Pastor Angel mentioned at the end of the buzz, we've been reading through the Bible together chronologically for any guests that are joining us. We started in Genesis, the beginning of the year. We will end with Revelation because that's where the, the book ends. And we're going to end there the end of the year. But we've been reading through and we've been at this point in the history of the nation of Israel where God has, has led them out of slavery, out of Egypt, through the, the desert for 40 years into the promised land. They've, they've, they've established themselves in the land. We've read through the kings, how as they came to God and said, God, we want a king. And he says, no, you don't. Yes, we do. God gives them a king. Saul was the first king. David was the next king, greatest king in the, the history of the nation. Solomon, his son, the wisest man that ever lived. After Solomon, the, the nation of Israel, once unified, is now split into Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And they've lived this on again, off again, mostly off again relationship with God where they've rebelled and they've began to, to make idols unto themselves and worship the, the pagan gods of the region and of the other nations around them. And God has for generations been sending prophets to proclaim judgment upon them and in and, and, to try and get them to turn back to God. Turn your hearts back to me. And, and, and prophet after prophet, Isaiah now into Jeremiah, has come to the, the people of God and said, you need to turn your hearts, otherwise God is going to judge you for your rebellion and he will judge you for your sin. And rather than softening their hearts and leading them to repentance, it's only caused them to harden their hearts only further. And so we, we have... The, Gotten to, to the book of Jeremiah this week in our reading. We started last Sunday, Jeremiah chapter 1. Yesterday we read through chapter 25. And, and Jeremiah, contrary to popular belief, was not a bullfrog. I'll let that sit there, give you a chance to, to get that before we move on. You're like, wow, that was really lame. I know. Two of those high school kids were mine, and so I'm a dad of two high schoolers, so I feel like I can tell lame dad jokes and get away with it, and it's my favorite part of being a dad. But Jeremiah was not a bullfrog. Jeremiah was a prophet. In, in particular, he was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah mostly, and there were occasional words given to other, the other nations, the other people groups that were living around Jerusalem and around Judah, and, and words of warning from, from God saying that God is going to bring judgment for their antagonistic behavior towards the people of God. But, but Jeremiah, he, he serves as a prophet, and, and at this point in history, we, in the book of Jeremiah, we get to the point where the the people of Judah and the southern kingdom, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin are taken off to live in captivity, to live in exile in Babylon. And in our reading next month, we're going to get into stories like Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, the three young Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, stories that, that if you grew up in church, you remember the flannel graphs being taught in Sunday school. Those all happened during Babylonian captivity. Up until this point, God has been warning them, the time is now upon us. We've seen in our reading this week how that Nebuchadnezzar comes and he, he takes them off into captivity, but we are right now in the course of history, two-thirds of the way uh, to Jesus. We're getting close. Matthew chapter 1 gives us the genealogy of Jesus, and Matthew tells us that it was 14 generations from Abraham to David. It was 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, which we currently find ourselves. And then it was another 14 generations from the exile to Jesus. So for those of you that have been, been reading the Old Testament, looking for Jesus, looking for Jesus, because all of God's word points to Jesus, you've been looking for him. His birth is coming. It's right around the corner. I know you feel like I've been promising you that since February, but, but I promise you his birthday is October 1st this year. 
I'm not saying that because that's when Jesus was born. He's actually born not December 25th, probably sometime around September. Maybe we'll talk about that in October. But, but in, in October, on October 1st, we're going to get to the New Testament and our reading plan. But, but as we look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a, a prophet to the southern kingdom. The, the beginning of the book of Jeremiah gives us a little bit of time frame and context for when Jeremiah served. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1 says this. These are the words of Jeremiah who was the son of Hilkiah. Now, last week we talked about a king by the name of Josiah. Very good, thank you. Talked about a king by the name of Josiah and the the Bible tells us that that one day Josiah, he he ordered the, the reconstruction, not reconstruction, but but upgrades to the temple. It had been, it had fallen into ruin and and wasn't being taken care of. It, It needed some, some work done to it. And so he called his construction crews together. And one day a man found a scroll and the scroll happened to be the book of the law given to the prophet Moses. The law had been lost. They found the scroll. Does anybody remember who found the scroll? It was the high priest at the time. Does anybody remember his name? Hilkiah. So Hilkiah found the scroll and took it to Josiah. And now in Jeremiah, we read that Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priest, and we're not told explicitly that that it's the same Hilkiah, but I would tend to believe that it probably is. So uh, Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests from the town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, the Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And the Lord's messages continued throughout the reign of King Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, until the 11th year of the reign of King Zedekiah, another of Josiah's son, in August of that 11th year, the Bible tells us the, the people of Jerusalem were taken away as captives. So right from the beginning, we are, are given a, a kind of a historical timeline for, for the kings that Jeremiah served under, the time frame that Jeremiah served in and as you read the, the book of Jeremiah, we, we were talking, Angel and I, this week, and she said, Jeremiah might be one of my new favorite books. And I've read Jeremiah in the past, but I've never read it with as much historical context as I have this time through, reading through it chronologically. After reading how for literally hundreds of, of years, if we're 14 generations from David to the exile, if a generation is 30 years, you're looking at 420 plus years from the time that that David ruled as king to where we find ourselves now, a time and a period of such blatant rebellion. And so many times God has come to his people and encouraged them and pleaded with them and begged them to turn back to me, turn back to me, giving them pictures of, of Israel as a, as, as a wife who has, has wandered away and left their love to go pursue other lovers, as, as a child who is left in God, as, as this parent, that God as this husband who is longing for his people just to come back. I just want to be with you. I just want to be in relationship with you. And Angel said, Jeremiah might be one of my most, most fav- new favorite books because she's, a, she's high empath. She, she's she is very easy for her, and she, in fact, it's not even easy for her, it's natural for her, and she can't turn off feeling your stuff. Like when you are hurting, she feels your pain. When you are rejoicing, she feels that inside. For me, that's why we're such a great pair. Because I don't feel that. Like I can sympathize. I can feel for you, but I can't feel you. An angel in reading Jeremiah, she says, I just feel God's heart because God through Jeremiah is coming to his people and he's saying, just come back. Why, why are you hurt? My heart is literally breaking inside of me. Jeremiah serves from right before the exile up until and even during the exile We see God's broken heart over his people. Jeremiah often referred to as the weeping prophet. 
Because there are times in Jeremiah where it's not God crying, but Jeremiah is crying tears for his country, for his countrymen, for the condition of things, crying out and praying and pleading with God, God, hold back your judgment. There are even times in this book where God comes to Jeremiah on several occasions and says, Jeremiah, stop praying for the people. Like that, that's when you know it's bad. Like you go to somebody and say, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. I'll pray for you. I'll be praying for you. Like that's the Christian response, right? I'll be praying for you. But imagine you went to somebody in your, in your, in your pain and they're like, well, I went to God and God told me I can't pray for you. <laughs> that's, the, that, that's how far it's gotten during the, the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah continues in the imagery we've seen before, again, particularly the image of Israel as, as an unfaithful wife. Jeremiah chapter 2, if you want to turn one page in your Bible. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1 says that the, the Lord gave Jeremiah a message. Here's what he says to Jeremiah. He says, I want you to go shout this message to Jerusalem that this is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago. I remember he's he's thinking back on the early days of their relationship. I don't know at 40 years if you guys have had conversations about the, the early days. I know my oldest son was over at their house yesterday and they must have been because he was sending me all of these old pictures of me with like the laughing emojis. And so I'm sure there were conversations and I'm sure there have been conversations thinking back to, man, those early, those early days. And that's what God's doing here with his bride, with the, the people of Israel. I remember what it was like early in our relationship when you would follow me, how you loved me and followed me even through the wilderness. I remember what it was like. I wish we could go back to those days. God is is speaking to his bride saying, I wish we could go back. But he continues and he says, what what did I do that was so wrong that caused you to leave me? How did I wrong you in such a way that caused you to walk away? Reminds me of Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter two, we're given a letter to the church in Ephesus and Jesus, through John the Revelator to the church, the group of believers in Ephesus, he says, this I have against you. This is my beef with you. This is my problem with you, is that you've left your first love. Not that you've lost your love. Not that you've fallen out of love. It's that you have willingly and will fully chosen to walk away and leave your love. This I have against you. It's interesting when you look even at the the history of the church in Ephesus, we see Paul probably starts this church in around AD 52. About 10 years later, he writes a letter to the church in Ephesus, which we find in our New Testament as the book of Ephesians, encouraging them and blessing them. It's a beautiful letter. A few years later, he sends John to pastor that group of people. And then 40 years, it's been about 40 years from the time the church was founded until Revelation was given to John. And and Jesus says to the, the church in Ephesus, you've left your first love. 40 years for a church to start here and end up here. And it's like, how did it happen that quickly? And yet when you look at church history, it's littered with churches and movements that start here and end here. And I know what you're thinking because I thought the same thing. I don't want us to be that. I don't want us to be one of those statistics. And if you don't want us to be one of those statistics, then you need to make sure that you're not one of those statistics. Because as you go, we go. Because you are the church. And if you say, I don't want our church to start here and end here, then in your life, sir, ma'am, young person, don't allow yourself to be at this place and over time drift so far to where God comes to you and says, you have willfully walked away from your first love. God comes and he, he writes and he, he speaks through Jeremiah. He says, why won't you come back? Why have you not listened? 
For Angel, she reads this and she feels God's heart. As I read through Jeremiah, you know what it reads like to me as I read through the book of Jeremiah? And just, I'm sorry, but to me, the book of Jeremiah reads like a breakup mixtape. <laughs> I know some of you like don't even know what a mixtape is. In my day, we didn't have Apple Music and Spotify. We had LimeWire and BearShare. And we would, we would download songs, and then we would take these songs and we would burn them onto CDs. You don't even know what a CD is? That's another conversation for another day. But here's the thing. In big moments of your life, you would make these CDs. And you would put all of these songs that encompass how you're feeling onto the... If you like a person, you make them a CD and you give them... I made you a mixtape. And I made Pastor Angel a lot of CDs back in the day. You break up with somebody, you made yourself a mixtape with all of these songs. If you're going on a road trip, you make a mixtape. And, and, and to me, Jeremiah reads like a mixtape. And if I, was gonna, if I was gonna make a tape for God to Israel, the first song I would put on this breakup mixtape would be Boys to Men, End of the Road. I'm not even joking. Like when you, when you go through the lyrics of end of the road, it's exactly what God is saying. We belong together. And you know that I'm right. Come on. How could you play with my heart? How could you play with my heart? Right? He goes on. Will you love me again like you loved me before? This time I want you to love me much more. It's unnatural. You belong to me. I belong to you. That's the covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. Boys to men had it. They knew it. Even at the end when the dude's like, baby, you know I love you. All those nights you were out chasing those other men, I knew about it. But I'm still here for you, girl. Just come back. Just come back to me. <laughs> Some of you aren't going to be able to listen to boys to men the same anymore. And you're welcome for that. But to me, this is how Jeremiah reads because God is putting his heart out there. And it's like, why? How did we get to this place where you've walked away and I'm still here and I want you back? Maybe if Boys to Men isn't your generation, Fleetwood Mac, go your own way. Maybe that would be. But God is, is, is through Jeremiah, he's speaking to them. That's not my message. Just want just to give you a picture into the book of Jeremiah and into my head. This morning, there's a, a couple of things that I want to highlight, a couple of passages in Jeremiah. And I want us to use the New Testament passage, John chapter 4. That's kind of a supporting text today. In chapter two, God, through Jeremiah, and I, I want to read it. It's not in your notes. And if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to continue to do so. If, if you're not taking notes, just download the Dream City Omaha app. All of my notes, and there's a place for you to fill in blanks and to take your own notes. It's all right there for you. So if you're, you're struggling with taking notes, just download the app. And the, the, this verse isn't in the app, but I want to read it. I was going to paraphrase it, but I want to read it. Chapter two, verse 10. Jeremiah says this to, to the people. He says, go west and look in the land of Cyprus. Go east and search through the land of Kedar. Has anyone ever heard of anything as strange as this? Has any na nation ever traded its gods for new ones? Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and in dismay, says the Lord. What he's saying is you can search the entire world and you will never see another example of a group of people leaving their gods to find new ones. Even the pagan Canaanites are more faithful to their gods who are not gods than you are to the one true living God. 
Even the people who are worshiping worthless idols worship them with more faithfulness, more vigor, more passion than you worship me with. How crazy does that sound? He gets to verse 13, and here's what he says in verse 13, and this is in your notes. For my people have done two evil things, two things. Number one, they've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug for themselves cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now, I don't know if you have a cistern at home, but if you don't, then like me, you would read this and very easily kind of browse through it. Maybe fountain of living water kind of strikes a chord in your brain because of John chapter 4 and we think that this term living water is a, a spiritual term when really it's not. It was a very common term in ancient Israel because there were two ways to get potable water, to get, to get drinkable water. Number one was from a moving source. So you had a river, a stream, uh, a spring that came up from underground. They would call that living water because it was moving, because it was active, because it wasn't stagnant. This is, this is living water and it brings refreshment and it satisfies and it, we, can, we can take it and we can, we can use it. But if you didn't live in an area where there was a stream or there was living water available, then what you had to do is you had to dig these cisterns where they would, in the, the foundation, in the limestone, they would dig down, sometimes 20, 30 feet, dig a cavern underground to collect rainfall during the rainy season so that then they could have a source of fresh water during the seasons that it was dry. And it's hard for us to understand. It's like, well, is it like a well? Not necessarily. Several years ago, they were doing construction in Jerusalem. They were building a playground in a neighborhood. And as they were building this playground, they, they came across one of these cisterns. I got a couple of pictures. If you guys want to go ahead and put those pictures up. So this is what above ground looks like. It's just a hole in the ground. And you think, okay, well, what's that going to do? Well, in the rainy season, all the water would funnel into that hole down into this well. Go and put the next picture up. And this is what the cistern looked like. And you can see a man with a scuba mask and a snorkel there swimming through the water. But as they dug these cisterns, what, what would often happen is they would start digging and they would get to a place where there might be a crack in the rock. And when water would fill the cistern because of that crack in the rock, the water would find its way out of the cistern. And then they would come back and there would be no water. And what God is saying here is he's saying you, you had a fountain of living water and you've chosen to abandon that and instead have chosen to dig cisterns for yourself, which were cracked and can hold no water at all. What, what's, what's really he's saying here? He's saying, I am the one who satisfies you. And rather than finding your satisfaction in me, in your refreshment in me, you have chosen to pursue all of these other things in an attempt to bring refreshment to yourself, only to find that they didn't bring refreshing at all, but they only left you empty and dry and barren and with nothing to show for it. You've gone through all of this work and all of these passions that you've expended and all of these other things rather than coming to the fountain of living water. This morning as we, we read through Jeremiah and as we study Jeremiah, the first thing that if you're taking notes, I want you to understand is that only God satisfies each and every one of us, there's this longing in our soul. And if you try and find and satisfy that longing in anything outside of Jesus, it will only leave you dry and empty like those broken cisterns. Young person, that relationship that you are, are so desperate for, that you are willing to compromise your values and your morals and yourself to go out and to find, hoping and thinking that, that this is what will bring satisfaction to my soul, only to have it and be more empty than you were before. Why? Because that relationship is just a cracked cistern. So that promotion at work or that raise that you think is going to bring fulfillment to your life, it's just a cracked cistern. 
Anything that you pursue outside of God's will and outside of pursuing him first will end up being a cracked sister. Now, I'm not saying relationships are bad and promotions are bad and raises are bad and new houses are bad and new cars. I'm not saying any of that stuff is bad. But what I am saying is if you're looking to those things to bring satisfaction, God says it will just be a broken sister. There are cracks in that wall that maybe you can't see now. But once you dig it out a little further, they will begin to reveal themselves. Isn't that the way the enemy works? Like we think we're getting somewhere and maybe that cistern holds water water for the first 12 inches, first two feet, first three feet. So what do we do? We keep moving in that direction. We keep digging. We keep getting after it. Only to one day get to a point where now our water's all gone. Reminds us of a conversation in John chapter 4 that Jesus has with a woman at a well in Samaria. Conversation with a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 where Jesus comes into town and he asks this woman for a drink and she, she says, well, you know, why are you even talking to me? He says, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. Sir, you don't have anything to draw water with. How can you give me a drink? There's this conversation that goes back and forth and in verse 13, <laughs> Here's what Jesus says to her, anyone who drinks this water, the the well water, the water in this cistern will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. He says, you can drink this water and still be thirsty, but the water that I give, you will never thirst again. Sir, how can I find that water? They have this conversation Jesus is trying to get her to to see what he's saying. And he finally gets to the point where they're talking about worship. And she says, I know one day the Messiah is going to come. And he says, hey, that's me. She goes back into town and she says, hey, everyone, come, come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Jesus tells this woman that the things that I give will be like that living water that never runs dry. If you will seek to be satisfied, not with the water that you have in this well or the water that your ancestors gave or the water that your boss can give or the water you find in relationship, if you can seek to satisfy yourself in me and only through me, then you will be satisfied. Everything else is simply a cracked cistern. We see it in the scripture. We see it in our lives. What are you looking to, to bring satisfaction to your soul? What are the things that you're pursuing? Where are you giving energy to? What are, what are you working hard at, hoping to one day have something to show for it? If the first and foremost thing in your life is not God, then those other passions and desires and dreams, that next business deal, the next contract that you sign, the next degree that you earn, the next more number, more letters you get to put in front of your name, whatever the case may be, it's just a crack sister. If you can't be satisfied in God, you won't be satisfied. That's what Paul said in the New Testament. He said, I've had everything and I've had nothing. I've had a full belly and I've been starving. I've been, I've been everywhere. I've seen it all. He says, I've found the secret to be content in all situations. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's saying, if you can't find satisfaction in God, then it doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. You won't be satisfied. But once you're satisfied in him and through him and by him, and he is the living water to your soul that you've been crying out for, then it doesn't matter what you go through, you will be able to walk through with a heart of contentment because you know that it's not about what's happening around me, but it's about what God is doing in me. Only God satisfies. Just skip a a few chapters for Jeremiah chapter 7. We're going to read another word that God gave to Jeremiah. And here's what Jeremiah says to to the people of Judah, God's word for them. God says, even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. Even now. Nebuchadnezzar is literally knocking on the door of Jerusalem. 
And God says, even now, if you would just repent and turn from your ways, I'll let you stay here. Still couldn't, still couldn't do it. If, if, if only God is satisfied, then, then how do I find that satisfaction? He says, even now, I'll let you stay in your own land, but don't be fooled. By those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. What was happening is Jeremiah was coming to the people and he's saying, listen, you've been rebellion. You've been rebelling. You've been sinning. You've been chasing these other things. God's bringing judgment. Nebuchadnezzar is coming. God's going to send armies from the north. You're going to be taken away. You're going to be held captive. You're going to live in exile. You know, all of these things. And there were people, not just, not just politicians, not just kings, not just rulers, not just tribal leaders. But there were prophets who claimed to be from God who stood up and said, this is all nonsense. This isn't true. God would never do that. Look at the temple. The temple is here. God wouldn't destroy us because the temple is here. And that's what they're saying. The temple is here. The temple is here. Solomon built this temple. This is the, the house of God. This is the place his presence dwells. This is the very picture of the worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And God would never allow this to be destroyed. He would never allow us to go through that. Jeremiah, inspired by God, says, don't be fooled by the people who say the temple is here. The temple is here. In verse 8, he continues, he says, don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think that you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, burn incense to Baal, and all those other new gods of yours, and then come here, stand before me in my temple and chant, we are safe, only to go right back to all those evils again? As I read this verse, there was just like, like flashing on a page. Because I think if ever there was a picture of the American church, you think you can come into my presence and worship me only to go and commit adultery and lie and cheat and steal and have hatred in your hearts. I mean, I haven't committed adultery. Jesus said, if you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. You think you can come in my presence and worship me and say the temple is here and we are safe only to go out there, go back to all of those other things again and expect to be good? And I read this and it just like was flashing on a page. Don't believe all the false prophets who say God would never do that. Don't believe all those who, and, uh, I, don't have, I don't have the time to get into all that nonsense. You can find a prophet to tell you whatever you want to hear. Go read Jeremiah chapter, I think it's chapter 24. 24 or 25, Hananiah. If you haven't read that story yet, go and read that story. Maybe we'll talk about that next Sunday. He says, don't be fooled by the false prophets. Don't be fooled by the politicians. Don't be fooled by all these people who, who are getting you to live in a place of comfort and complacency. Because what makes you think that you can come in here and worship me and then go do all of these other things during the week and still be good? See, the problem with Judah at this point is they had the symbol of worship, the temple. And they were so focused on the symbol of worship that they had forgotten the substance of worship. They were so preoccupied with their holy places that they failed to become holy people. They were content with religion when all God wanted was relationship. If you're here today and you have longings in your soul and you've been, you've been digging cisterns only to find that they had cracks in them, leaving you empty and dry and broken and barren and you put in so much work and now there's nothing but heartbreak to show for it. 
You're here today. It's like, okay, well, if God can satisfy me, then, then how do I find that satisfaction? Satisfaction doesn't come through religion. It comes through relationship. It's only through relationship. Haley, you can come back. John chapter four, we, we saw this conversation between Jesus and this woman and she, she leaves and she's, her eyes have been opened, not, not physical eyes, but the eyes of her understanding, the eyes of enlightenment. She, she recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. She goes running back into town and she encourages everybody in town. You need to come see this man. You need to come, you need to come meet this man. And at her words, the Bible says that, that there were many people who believed and they came running out from this town and Jesus and the disciples are here. And, and it's at this point that Jesus says, look up because the harvest is ripe. He wasn't speaking to the fields. He was speaking to the people coming out of the village, drawing the disciples' attention that that is your harvest. And they come out to see Jesus and they beg Jesus please stay in our village. Please stay in our village. And this is a part of John chapter four that if we preach it, we teach it, we study it. This is uh, about the part we move on and we, we really don't emphasize this particular verse. But they come out and they ask Jesus to stay for two days. They ask Jesus to say, Jesus stays for two days. And it says that many of them had, had believed at this point. John chapter four, verse 42 the people say to the woman, the woman at the well, now we believe, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we've heard him ourselves. Because we've heard him ourselves, now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Your stories were great. But now that I've heard him, I know that he's the savior. Your stories were cool and they were fascinating, but now that I've had a chance to experience him personally, now I know that I can be satisfied. It's not until you have a personal encounter and a personal experience with the creator and the lover of your soul that you can be satisfied. You can come into church week after week and I can, I can tell you stories. I can sing boys to men to you. I can tell you about a God who loves you, who even before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. He had a plan for you and he had a purpose for you and he designed you and he created you wonderfully unique and in all of his creation that you are his favorite. I can tell you about a God who longs just to be in relationship with you. I can tell you about a savior who died for you, who bore your sin and bore your shame and paid the price for you on your behalf who didn't have to, but chose to give his life so that you could have opportunity at new life to redeem and to restore what was lost and what was broken, who hung on the cross for the remission of your sin and three days later got up so that you could live a victorious life through him and by him. I can tell you about the Holy Spirit who is the seal upon the believer, who's the comforter and who's the advocate who will lead you into all truth who will tell you which way to go and which things to avoid, who will empower you and equip you to live the life that you were created to live to where now you no longer have to live as a slave to your sinful nature, but by the spirit, you could be empowered to live and walk in a new life. You can come into church, watch online week after week after week after week. And I can tell you story after story after story, but until you have a personal encounter with God, until you experience him for yourself, young person, to where it's not about what mom and dad say or grandma and grandpa say, but it's about what I know to be true in my heart because I heard him for myself. Your stories were great, lady, but now we believe, not because of what you told us, but because of what we've experienced. Now we know that he's the savior of the world. This morning, I know there are many of you who have longings in your soul and longings in your spirit that you have been trying to, 
to satisfy in selfish desires and worldly passions, maybe even in good things, trying to build a business, trying to to be in relationship, trying to, to, to take that next step in what you think your life needs to or should be, only to get to the bottom of that cistern and there's a a fissure, there's a crack running right through the middle of it and all your water is pouring out. Now you're stuck. at The bottom of this hole with nothing but dryness and emptiness and it's like, God, there has to be more. God, there has to be more and the good news today is there is. It's not found in stuff. It's not found in people. It's not found in money. It's not found in prestige. It's not found in success. It's not found in romance. It's not found in popularity. It's not found in any of those other things. The only thing that brings satisfaction is relationship with your heavenly father. This morning, I don't know where you find yourself. I don't know what conversations you had walking in this morning. I don't know what thoughts you've had during the course of this week. But I do know God's heart and I do know God's character. And our reading today is Jeremiah chapter 29. Part of our reading for today is Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 is a very famous passage of scripture, often quoted. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Good plans, not plans to harm you. Plans to give you hope, future, expected end. Because that's God's heart. That's God's heart for the exiles in Babylon. That's God's heart for you today. Go back to Exodus chapter three. I've seen the cries and I've heard the cries of my people. My heart is to deliver them and set them free. God's heart for you is to satisfy, he just wants to satisfy you. He wants to heal those broken places. He wants to fill those empty places. Those things are only filled and they're only healed in him. If you would, would you stand with me this morning? This is, the, this is the point in the story. We are at John chapter four, verse 41. Where the people have heard Jesus, they've heard the woman, they've heard the stories. They have to decide what to do with it. Because you can come, you can hear another message. You can choose to like Israel before them and like the kingdom of Judah, choose to, instead of softening your hearts and allowing it to draw you back to God, you can allow it to harden your heart to where you walk out more calloused and closed off than you were before you came in. Or you can choose to to come before God in a, a posture of surrender. Say, God, I've tried everything else tried all I know to do. The only thing left is you. When the only thing left is God, you'll find that the only thing that you ever needed was him. Today, if you've been saved for 50 years, there's longings in your heart. God's word for you is to draw near. Draw closer, just come a little bit closer. I know you love me. I know we're, just come a little bit closer. Don't look to other things, but stay focused on me. Allow God to fill, allow God to satisfy. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus and you're like those people in the village, and you're like, I don't know, I just came to church today, I just turned online and some guy told me some story and I encountered and I experienced and I heard for myself and I don't really understand it all and I don't really know it all, but I know that there's something to this and I know that Jesus is the savior of the world. 
Today, your choice, your next step is to place your faith in him. To repent of your sins, that means to turn from them, to stop walking the direction that you have been to turn around and surrender your life to Christ. Place your faith in him. None of us are saved by what we do. We're only saved because we place faith in Jesus. So today, your, your choice is to either leave and go back to the empty, unsatisfying grind that you've been stuck in or drink from the living water. Water that does not dry and water that does not fail to satisfy. But if you would just place your faith in him, if you would just confess your sin to him, he would be faithful to forgive you. He will send you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will empower you to live the life that you want to live and that you were created to live and that your soul is longing to live. The question is, what will we do with it? May we not be like Israel. May we not be like Judah. God would never, God could never, this is nonsense. I'm good because I come to the holy place without allowing God to make us a holy people. But may we be those who pursue him passionately, who hunger and thirst for righteousness because then we'll be filled. We will not dig cisterns trying to satisfy with other things. But God, would you bring the satisfaction that each of us needs? Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement. God, even in your, your message of judgment to your people, the encouragement that is to be found because in Jeremiah, yes, there's judgment and there's rebellion, but you're also, you're, you're communicating your heart that it's not gonna be forever. And if you would just come back to me, Lord, today, for those of us that need to repent, we repent. For those that need to confess, we confess. For those that have never placed faith in you, Lord, today, I pray that they would not leave this place without making a, a conscious decision to lay down their desires and their passions and their dreams and get up out of their cisterns and come running to the living water. Lead them into relationship with you, Lord, that, that the gospel would be made alive in their hearts. The good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, for those that come in and we are empty and we are dry and we are longing, for those that are sitting on the couch at home right now that, that are unsatisfied with life and how it's going. Lord, may we not seek to dig cisterns that will only leave us empty. But God, today we recognize through your word through the words of your prophet Jeremiah, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit today, that only you satisfy. And coming to church and listening online and participating in the symbol of worship without surrendering to the substance of worship doesn't satisfy. God, would you fill us fresh and anew that we would find satisfaction in you alone and Lord when we find satisfaction and when we delight in you thank you that you give us the desires of our hearts that you bring all of those other things but it's not until you are number one Lord go with us this week Give us a new level of satisfaction. Increase our hunger. Increase our thirst. As we continue in Jeremiah, continue to reveal your heart for your people and your character that we might stand firmly on your word. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, listen, on your way out, DJ. 
Here at Dream City Omaha, we're all about three things, helping each other discover Christ, recover identity, or uncover purpose. We hope that this message helps serve one of those three goals, and we encourage you to check out our past sermon series and online classes, no matter where you are in your walk with Christ.